Zelda 1, the game that started it all. Before people were embarking on mass multiplayer action adventure games and screaming at each other over voice chat and first person shooters, they were bombing random walls with the small glimmer of hope that it would do something, or they were wandering around without the slightest idea of where the hell they were supposed to be going. Gaming was a simpler time back in the 1980s, where many games were regarded as cryptic and insanely difficult. This is not necessarily due to the sadistic and twisted minds of early game developers, mind you. It was because limitations of video game hardware at the time would not allow games to be very long, so in order to increase the playtime of these games for consumers, the difficulty was oftentimes ramped up quite a bit. Nobody was going to want to buy a $50 NES game that could only be beaten in an hour or two, especially for an exploration adventure game like The Legend of Zelda. So today we are going to take a time machine back to 1986 and see how Zelda 1 on the NES holds up today as I complete it. Also FYI, I will be playing through the first quest in this video and not the second quest. So the game's title screen kicks off with a short intro to the story of the game, which explains how Princess Zelda divided the Triforce of Wisdom into eight pieces and hid them from Ganon before she was captured by him. The game doesn't really explain this, but since all the dungeons containing the Triforce Shards are overridden by Ganon's minions, it implies that Ganon located these shards that Zelda hid and deployed his forces to guard them. So it's our duty to retrieve these Triforce of Wisdom Shards in order to restore Zelda's power and save her from Ganon. Following this short story introduction, the different in-game items are shown that will help Link on his adventure. There is also a message to look at the game's manual for details. Now of course, I didn't look at this manual instruction booklet until after I completed this game, but it actually can includes a lot of good information in order to help players get adjusted to how this game works. In today's day and age, most of us who play these Zelda games know how it generally works, where you collect rupees, buy items, bomb walls, but back in the day when this was the first Zelda game, all of that stuff was new to everyone, so reading the game's manual was pretty important to know what the heck you were supposed to be doing. As I was reading through the manual, I noticed something interesting with how the manual explains the game's dungeons. In modern Zelda games, the dungeons are referred to as temples, dungeons, and shrines, but the Zelda 1 manual explains how the dungeons are called underground labyrinths, and these underground labyrinths are part of the underworld, while the overworld is the area outdoors with the mountains and trees. This terminology of overworld and underworld could even be seen as a precursor to the beloved A Link to the Past's Light World and Dark World on the Super Nintendo. Another interesting tidbit is that Zelda 1's dungeons are called levels in-game, ranging from level 1 to level 9. These may have been called levels to pay homage to the vastly popular Super Mario Bros. that came out a year before Zelda 1 in 1985. Zelda 1's instruction manual goes into depth about what the different items in the game do in order to give the player clues on how the game can be beaten, such as where you can use the stepladder or raft. The manual also explains all the different enemies, including where they are found, as well as little hints about strategies to defeat them. Even though I didn't read this manual before playing the game, and frankly I didn't even know this manual existed until I was editing this video, I had a good background on this game from playing it on my 3DS back in 2012. So with that, I created a new game file and started the adventure. So the game kicks off by dropping you into an open looking area with a cave nearby. Inside of the cave, you are greeted with perhaps one of the most cliché gaming quotes of all time, it's dangerous to go alone, take this, as you pick up your sword. From here the game really lets you take the reins on how you want to play the game, where you're pretty much open to explore the entire overworld from the beginning. There are a few required items to progress to certain areas such as the rafts you get from level 3 and the fact that you need to beat levels 1 through 8 before you can progress to level 9, which is the final dungeon of the game. In fact, you are able to complete levels 1 through 8 in any order you want to. In order to progress in some of the later levels, you need certain items such as the stepladder from level 4, but there's no stopping you from entering level 4, finding the stepladder, leaving the dungeon before completing it, and completing level 8. This level of openness does not exist in any other Zelda game besides Breath of the Wild, but even in Breath of the Wild, there is that tutorial section at the beginning of the game on the Great Plateau before you are able to explore the rest of the map. So based on that, you could say that Zelda 1 is the most open world out of all the Zelda games. In fact, picking up the sword at the very beginning isn't even required to beat the game, as many people have taken on the challenge to beat this game without obtaining the sword. But I'm not that good at the game, so I'll stick with the sword. So at the beginning of the adventure, I just started to wander around Hyrule, kill enemies, and collect rupees. I didn't use a guide to beat this game for this video, 
so I spent a decent amount of time just wandering around and trying to figure out where to go. Even though I played this game back in 2012, and do somewhat remember some tidbits to help me get through this game, a lot of stuff wasn't fresh on my mind, and I spent a while not knowing exactly how to progress or where certain dungeons were. I remembered where the first dungeon was, so I went north, killed some Octorox, passed some Zora fish monsters that looked like grumpy clowns, and entered level 1. This dungeon was obviously meant as a tutorial for this game, and it was pretty easy, so I knocked it out with no sweat. After that, I started to wander around, bought the blue candle, stocked up on some hearts, burned this suspicious looking tree, and accidentally stumbled across the 8th dungeon of this game. Yes, you can actually enter the 8th dungeon of this game before even entering any of the others. After getting my ass handed to me by a 4-headed plant monster, I decided to try and knock out the easier dungeons first. Also, by the way, this guy right here gives you arguably the worst deal in any Zelda game. Like, who in their right mind would choose a potion over a permanent increase in health? That old fool. Also, there's this other type of seer in this game where if you bomb random walls or burn random trees, you can find this moblin that gives you rupees and says, It's a secret to everybody. I never thought much of this when I was younger, but this makes you wonder what the story behind these moblins are. I guess there's a group of monsters rebelling against Ganon by helping out Link? This conspiracy could honestly take up its own video. Also, another thing worth mentioning are the massive amounts of secrets that are possible to find in this game. I don't know the exact number of hidden areas in the game, but if you just walk around the overworld and place bombs and burn trees randomly, you will rack up a lot of secret areas which give rewards such as rupees and item shops. Except there is a chance that a secret area has this clown in it who makes you pay him rupees in order to fix his door. Also, whoever uses a tree as a door to their home is beyond me. This has to be one of the first instances of trolling in video games. Like, the developers of this game had to have been chuckling to themselves at the thought of how many kids would get pissed off when they coded this in. Another troll that I found in this game is this old biddy that only tells you how to get through the Lost Wiz when you pay her a specific amount of rupees. If you pay her 10 rupees, she says you have to pay more, and if you pay 50 rupees, she says boy you're rich, without telling you anything else. If you pay 30 rupees, however, she tells you how to get through the forest. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure there's no way of knowing which option you're supposed to pick until you keep paying until you choose the correct option. This isn't that big of a deal since the game gives you lots of rupees from walking around and killing enemies, but I couldn't help but chuckle to myself when I came across this lady while I was playing. So after beating level 2, which wasn't hard to find and was out in the open, I traveled through the Lost Woods and found myself in level 6. After exploring the dungeon a bit, I chickened out and left since I realized how underpowered I was. So from here I began exploring Hyrule in search of the other dungeons. At this point in my adventure, I became stuck and had a really tough time trying to find other dungeons that weren't crazy difficult. While I was wandering around aimlessly, I bought some food because I knew ahead of time that it's required to beat the game, found the white sword, showed a piece of paper to another old biddy and unlocked a potion shop that I didn't use, and journeyed back to level 8 to find this book of magic that I still don't know what it does, even after beating the game. I also came across this gambling game where you pay 10 rupees to have the chance of winning some rupees, losing some rupees, or losing lots of rupees. I don't know what it was with this game, but it seems like almost every single time that I played it, I would get the worst option a large majority of the time. Maybe this guy's still salty about me breaking down his door, I don't even know. So from here, as I was randomly bombing suspicious walls, I somehow found level 9, as if I needed to find all the hard dungeons right now. But I didn't get very far in that dungeon because in order to progress, you need to beat levels 1 through 8 first. So then I began wandering more, bought some errors for no particular reason, and found this claw looking thing that lets you push stone blocks. This claw looking thing is the power bracelet, and it's actually an optional item in the game that lets you fast travel to different parts of the overworld. I didn't really use this fast travel system much because the map is relatively small, so it doesn't take more than 3 minutes to get from one side of the map to the other. I also found this old lady that gives you a hint to explore the graveyard, which leads to an old man who eventually gives you the magical sword. A lot of people complain about this game being cryptic, but the game actually gives you enough hints to know where to go. It's just that the hints require some thought to understand what they mean exactly. So with this, I stumbled across level 3, which was out in the open, so I'm not sure how I didn't come across it while I was wandering around so long. One aspect about the game that doesn't really age well is the map system, which is hardly a map at all because it's just a rectangle with the square inside of it that's supposed to represent Link. It's hard to know what you already explored or where things are in relation to each other. All the map tells you is where you are generally located in relation to the rest of the map tiles. But anyway, I started venturing through level 3 until I found the raft, which was heavily guarded for some reason despite it only being a bundle of wood. After getting the raft, the rest of the dungeon was a breeze after I collected the next piece of the Triforce. From here I knew exactly where to go after wandering around so long prior to finding level 3. 
I took my newly acquired raft and sailed over to level 4. This dungeon had a few challenging aspects, but I trudged through regardless. This dungeon also has a hint for the level 5 location, where you find an old man who tells you to walk into the waterfall. There's only really one waterfall in the game pretty much, so it's pretty obvious to know what he's talking about. After beating level 4 and acquiring the stepladder, which is another necessary item to beat the game in addition to the raft, I went straight to the waterfall which revealed a clue on how to access level 5. Before entering level 5, however, I stocked up on a couple of more heart containers and went back to the graveyard to talk to the old man. Since I remember from playing this game before that you need 12 hearts to be able to obtain the magical sword that rests in front of him. I didn't realize this until playing this game for this video, but this method of obtaining the sword is very similar to how in Breath of the Wild, you need a certain amount of hearts to obtain the Master Sword. The developers of Breath of the Wild no doubt put this in the game in order to pay homage to the original Legend of Zelda game. So with the best sword in the game, I entered level 5. Level 5 wasn't too difficult, especially with my newly acquired magical sword. In this dungeon, you find a recorder which allows you to teleport to previously defeated dungeons as a fast traveling device. I didn't really use this item to fast travel much at all because I don't really see the need of why you would need to enter a dungeon that you have already completed, but the option is there if you so desire. The recorder does, however, have a mandatory use in order to get into level 7. To access level 7, you have to use the item while next to this lake that's near the Lost Woods. The only reason why I knew about this was from playing Hyrule Warriors on the Wii U, where you have to use items to unlock collectibles, and the location of where you use these items in Hyrule Warriors are an exact recreation of where you'd use the item if you were playing Zelda 1 on the NES. A lot of people claim that level 7 is the hardest and most cryptic dungeon to find in the game, which is probably true. However, the game does give you a fair amount of clues to find it. In level 6, you get a clue that reads, There are secrets where fairies don't live. In the overworld, mostly every time you see a pond, there is a fairy that heals you and brings you to full health. However, there is a pond near the Lost Woods that doesn't have a fairy, and that is what the hint is referring to. In addition to this, in the instruction manual that this game came with on the NES, there is a map that has a question mark on the exact screen where the entrance to level 7 is. I couldn't find any hints stating that you need to use your recorder to unlock the entrance to the dungeon, but if you knew there was a secret on the map screen from looking at the instruction manual, if you use all of the items in your inventory, you will eventually unlock the dungeon's entrance. This map in the instruction manual provides a lot of useful information to beat the game, such as the exact locations of levels 1 through 4, along with question marks where secrets are hidden, such as the location of the power bracelet. People oftentimes quote Zelda 1 as being the Zelda game that drops you at the beginning of the game with no explanation, but this manual really gives a solid description of what you're supposed to be doing. To be honest, I recommend anyone playing this game for the first time to reference this manual while playing because the manual tells you enough information to allow you to make progress in the game while using your brain without straight up telling you exactly where to go. Level 7 wasn't too difficult in the combat department, but it did take some trial and error to get through, where there are a few instances where you have to bomb a random wall in order to proceed through the dungeon. This isn't too bad because most rooms only have a couple of different walls to test out before you know that a room doesn't have a secret path, but it is kind of annoying that you have to grind for bombs in order for luck to, to determine if a wall is actually bombable or not. I like to call this feature Bomb and Prey, which certainly makes a comeback in levels 8 and 9. Luckily, a lot of future Zelda games fix this issue, where bombable walls clearly have a cracked look to them, or they make a certain noise when you hit your sword against them. Level 7 also had this annoying section where this enemy prevents you from progressing, and the only thing he says is grumble grumble. Coming into playing this game for this video, I knew that this grumble grumble was supposed to represent the enemy being hungry, where you have to place the food item in front of it to proceed through the dungeon. I couldn't find any hints in game that you're supposed to drop food in front of the guy, other than the grumble text, so I could see it be being very hard to understand what to do for a player that's not familiar with the solution to this puzzle. This grumble grumble text could easily be misinterpreted as the guy being annoyed or angry, so it's not very clear that he's supposed to be hungry. Let me know in the comments if you found any other in-game hints that you're supposed to drop food in front of the guy to proceed. After making my way through the rest of the dungeon, I came across the boss, which was laughably easy. For some reason, it was the same boss from level 1, and I killed it in two hits to the horn. After collecting the Triforce piece in level 7, I made my way back to level 6. Level 6 was the hardest dungeon in the game for me, as I died the most during it. I didn't know what that number under my save file meant when I first got to level 6, but as I kept dying over and over and over again, I realized it meant the number of times I've died. And I died a lot in level 6. From the time I first got to the dungeon to when I beat it, I went from 24 total deaths to a whopping 30 total deaths, which may not seem like a lot, but since level 6 is so remotely located, every time I died in the dungeon, I had to go from the starting area, get healed by the fairy, go through the lost woods, juke some centaurs, 
go through the graveyard, and go back to level 6. And that trip took a whole 4 minutes to even have an attempt to beat the dungeon. Also, I know you could select continue when you die in a dungeon to start back at the beginning of the dungeon, but that only starts you with 3 hearts, and 3 hearts will kill you in 2 hits in level 6, especially with the basic green tunic which I had. After repeatedly killing enemies and dying in level 6, I had enough rupees saved up to buy the blue ring, which was a major game changer as it basically doubles the amount of hearts you have since it reduces the amount of damage you take by half. I already knew about the location of this item going into this game, but it's definitely hidden away in an obscure location, which could lead to players not even coming across the item, even though it's almost a necessity to beating these harder later dungeons. I even struggled with level 6 a bit after I obtained the blue ring. I guess there's a question mark location in the game's manual on the screen of where the hidden item shop is located, so it's not that cryptic to find. My main challenge with level 6 were those blue wizard guys that take a whole two hearts away if you don't have the blue ring. Your invincibility window in between getting hit is pretty small in this game, where it's a little less than a second, so if you get trapped in a corner by one of these guys, your health can easily drain so fast. Also, it doesn't help that the item that you find in this dungeon, the magical rod, doesn't even damage these guys when they're the hardest enemy in the dungeon, so you have to get dangerously close while swinging your sword. But when you get close with your sword, they can easily fly towards you and damage you, and it doesn't help that they can move diagonally when Link is only restricted to moving up, down, left, or right. Finally, I made it to the boss of the dungeon, which was even easier than the level 7 boss. I feel like the developers of this game really lowered the difficulty of the bosses for some of the later dungeons of the game. In level 6, you come across the Goma boss, which you literally shoot one time in the eye with your bow and it dies. I guess that the main difficulty with this boss may be obtaining the bow and arrow, and knowing that you have to use your bow and arrow on the boss. In level 6, you find an old man who says, aim at the eyes of Goma. You find the bow in level 1, and you have to buy arrows by going into one of the item shops around the overworld of Hyrule. So with the necessary equipment, I was able to kill Goma, which left me with only one more Triforce piece to find. I then made my way over to level 8. Level 8 wasn't as bad compared to level 6, and the blue ring definitely helped out a lot. There was a lot of these blue Dark Nut guys that were pretty strong, but to be honest, their movement is super predictable when you get used to them where they can't change direction very fast after choosing a direction where to walk. There were also a lot of these orb-looking things called bubbles that were super annoying, but actually helped out during combat quite a bit. Instead of lowering your health when they touch you, they actually prevent you from using your sword for a short period of time after touching them. This can be used to your advantage, where if you're in a sea of enemies, you can touch one of them, and that will give you a period of invincibility to escape from being cornered by enemies that do damage. One thing that was hard not to notice about this game was the amount of lag. The graphics of this game were top-notch at the time that this game was released, so you kind of have to cut the game developers some slack, but there were numerous occasions where there's drastic slowdown when there are too many sprites on the screen at once, and this definitely slows down the pace of fighting enemies. While exploring level 8, I came across this item called a Magical Key, which was hidden behind a random wall that you had the bomb. The item is definitely optional, where it gives you unlimited keys by noting the letter A next to your key count. I have no idea what this A stands for, but I'll just assume it stands for Ass Ton of Keys. This item is definitely useful, albeit not crazy useful, so close to the end of the game. Also, up until the point that I collected the magical key, I had four keys saved up, so it's not like this game is that stingy with handing out keys. Also, I never even had to buy any keys from those shops that sell keys. Also, I'm not sure what Ganon was thinking, but it's definitely not a smart idea to use identical locks for all the locked doors across all the dungeons in the game. So after killing the four-headed Gleok boss, I collected the last piece of the Triforce and made my way over to the final dungeon of the game. Level 9 is definitely the longest labyrinth of a dungeon in the whole game, where there are 57 total rooms, chocked full of enemies, secret paths, and stairways, leading to other parts of the dungeon. Also, with a different music track compared to the previous other 8 dungeons, you know this dungeon means business. Along with level 7, this is the only other dungeon that I had to grind for bombs in the overworld, in order to have enough to test random walls to progress through the dungeon. Also, in preparation for beating this dungeon, I bought a magical shield which protects against magic attacks, and I didn't realize this until replaying this game for this video, but apparently if you get attacked by the like-like enemies that look like slinkies, they eat your magic shield, and in order to get your shield back, you have to pay another 80 rupees. These like-likes are probably the weirdest enemy in the game where they damage you by sucking. Also, one kind of lame thing about this dungeon is that in order to get the silver arrows, which are required to beat Ganon, you have to push this random block in this random room to unlock a staircase. I didn't look this up, but I only found it because I was randomly pushing blocks because I was sure that there were had to be some sort of secret for this room because it was at the dead end after killing a bunch of enemies. There was also this other pretty well hidden optional item which is the red ring, 
that I found after bombing a random wall and killing some hard enemies. The red ring is basically an upgraded blue ring, where the red ring quadruples the amount of damage you can take from your basic green tunic, which was a huge help in this dungeon, especially with the large amount of rooms you have to walk through in order to get to the final boss. After clearing the rooms in the dungeon and dying a few times, in one of my trips back to the dungeon in the overworld, I made a pit stop at one of the item shops to buy the food item, partly because I wanted to flex because I had a bunch of expendable rupees saved up, and partly because I wanted my rupee count to stay at a solid 69 rupees for a short bit. Also, I found this one guy selling a heart for 10 rupees. That has to be one of the worst deals that I've seen in any Zelda game. So in one of my trips back to level 9, I finally made it to Ganon, all geared up and ready for the final duel. And then I died. And then I walked all the way back to Ganon, swung my sword around aimlessly, shot him in the face when he turned orange, watched him turn into a pile of Cheeto dust, and then saved Princess Zelda. Honestly though, this has to be one of the most random ways to kill a boss in any Zelda game. I could have missed something, but the game doesn't really give you much hints at all that this is how you're supposed to kill Ganon. I guess the game just expects you to keep experimenting with random ways to beat him until you get it. And I guess that the main item in this dungeon is a silver arrow, so I guess that's a hint for you to try to use your silver arrows. Also, another funny thing that I noticed is that you can actually die by touching the fire at the end after defeating Ganon, in the room where Zelda is kept captive. But anyway, after you save Zelda, she gives you the option to start a second quest that I didn't play for this video. But if you enjoyed this video, let me know down in the comments and I can play the second quest and make a video about it in the future. So overall, I had fun playing Zelda 1 for the NES, which took me around 9 hours to complete from start to finish. I wouldn't say the game aged that well looking at it in the modern lens. There are a lot of moments in this game that didn't really make much sense that were required in order to beat it, such as dropping the food in front of the enemy that says Grumble Grumble, randomly knowing you have to play your recorder to open up level 7, or having to push a random block out of a sea of blocks in a random room in order to find the item that's required to beat the final boss. I probably wouldn't recommend anyone play this game without any backgrounds, but I would recommend people have the manual that this game came with handy if they do choose to play this game, in case they're confused on what they're supposed to do. I'd also recommend this game for people who are Zelda fans and want to experience the game that started it all. Lastly, I'd recommend this game for people who want a challenge. This game gives a lot of hints on what you're supposed to do, but these hints oftentimes require a lot of thought and brain power to figure out, such as the hint in level 4 to walk through the waterfall to find level 5, or the hint by the old man in a cave that tells you, Secret is in the tree at the dead end, which is a reference to where level 8 is located. Another thing about this game is that it requires you to explore in order to progress, so it's necessary to try bombing random walls or testing out burning random trees in order to progress. Many modern Zelda games try to hold your hand by telling you exactly where to go, and the only other Zelda game that broke this trend of many modern Zelda games was Breath of the Wild. It was actually pretty cool playing the game that Breath of the Wild took a lot of its inspiration from. So that was a video of me documenting my experience while playing Zelda 1 on the NES. Let me know if you enjoyed this type of video and I can make more of them in the future. The idea of these types of videos is that I'm playing older games that you may have forgotten about while documenting my experiences while playing them. I'm trying this new style of video out in order to switch things up, so let me know if you think I should stick with uploading my usual music videos that I upload. But either way, I hope to see you in the next one.